In recent years, climate change has been seen as the existential crisis of our time. But with the growing threat of coronavirus and a global health crisis on a scale many of us cannot comprehend, will the battle against climate change retain its urgency? To achieve net zero by 2050, we will need urgent action and the government will have to implement changes that will impact people's everyday lives. Some argue we will need to overturn our whole economic system, but with huge green innovation in the private sector, are free market solutions the way forward? Or should we be looking towards a global carbon tax? I'm Darren Grimes, Digital Manager at the IEA. Here to discuss this is Kingsmill Bond. Kingsmill is the energy strategist for Carbon Tracker. He believes that the energy transition is the most important driver of financial markets and geopolitics in the modern era. Hi, Kingsmill. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for the call, Darren. Now, Kingsmill, I'd like to start by asking you about the virus that's taking hold of the world economy and much else, actually, uh, raging around the world as we speak. What do you think the impact of coronavirus will be on the climate change debate itself? Do you think it will lose its urgency and its currency? So the virus is a cyclical and very uh, pressing issue but climate change is a structural and long-term issue. So I would expect the, 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 the short term to, to dominate over the long term for a while. Um, but I, I guess the key point to be made now, and, and this is a, I, I, our, our mantra at present, is that as we seek to use government stimulus to get us out of the cyclical problems of the coronavirus, we must make sure that we have a green structural solution and and don't make the mistakes that were made after 2008 and just burn ever larger amounts of coal. Mm. I wonder what you think then about the idea of, we keep hearing in the news at the moment that you know businesses are folding but crucially i think as far as this debate is concerned airlines could be folding as well i mean do you think now is the time to be shaming people for their carbon footprints and actually we've got it it is going to be a lot further down our our list of priorities isn't it I, i think um we've moved we moved quite a long way beyond shaming people for their carbon footprint um, the the key issue now is to make sure we can get through this current crisis. But as I say, we, we want to make sure that we, we get through it in a sustainable way. Um, and uh, now actually is as good a time as any to, to plan for a more realistic, sustainable future for this country. Uh, in some uh, quarters, it was pointed out by Ed Conway in The Times that uh, if you're a young environmentalist looking to combat climate change, what's better than coronavirus? Because it may- mainly kills older people who are statistically more likely to be climate sceptics. I mean, how-, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I-, I-, I don't think it's a very helpful debate at all. I mean, that's not the point. Um, these things are, are, are not actually particularly connected. They're both front of mind at the moment. Um, mm. But uh, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's not a particularly helpful idea. Um, now, again, with coronavirus in mind, do you think the public policy response to COVID-19 should be applied to climate change? Um, I mean, why do you think there's been such a behavioural inertia towards decarbonisation, but not coronavirus? Well, I guess this is human nature, isn't it? The, you want to deal with the immediate problem that's right before you and for which there are um, relatively clear uh, solutions. Whilst the, the, the long-standing problem of climate change has always been that, uh, it, that the problem is not right in front of us and we don't have to solve it today. Um, or so it has been said. I guess um, there's fires in Australia and... Um, and the Amazon and uh, all the other, all of the other problems of, that, that we've seen in the last uh, t- 12 months have somewhat changed that perspective and made people realise that they do need um, need a, a, a proper long-term plan to, um, to 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 solve this as well. But that, 
I, I has inevitably been swamped by the uh, the short term coronavirus issues. I mean, to put some context on this, the um, global warming, if if unchecked, has the capacity to 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 make um, Southeast Asia uh, basically uninhabitable and large swathes of, of the of the planet uninhabitable. Um, well, whilst the coronavirus uh, has the capacity to kill one percent of the world's population. Well, I mean, what are your predictions then for the impact on financial markets, and I guess your broader predictions for 2020? Because with the, if we think outside of coronavirus, we've also got the U.S. election coming up. Do you think there's there's going to be massive changes, not just in the financial markets and the economy? Of course, many economies facing recession, but do you think there will be this impetus for the kind of uh, policies that you'd like to see put forward once we have got over the the next few months which will clearly be very difficult for all of us the kind of world we want to have after that we just need to be very cognizant that this time around we better get it right and we better plan for a uh, a world which is more sustainable and indeed fairer for that matter um and um that, that, therefore, I think we shouldn't allow our judgment to be too swamped by by these uh, by these shorter term issues. You know, when it when it comes to the U.S. election, um, clearly uh, there will be a gulf between, or there is a gulf between the uh, Donald Trump, Trump approach to climate change and that of the Democratic Party. Could you just explain what Carbon Tracker actually is and why it was set up? So, Carbon Tracker is a think tank. Um, we uh, was set up about 10 years ago by um, a visionary leader called Mark Campanale. I bet um, he's delighted who, to hear that. Uh, well, <laughs> well, he is. What could you say? <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, uh, he is still um, running Carbon Tracker. And he, about 10 years ago, said, look, um, uh, we've got a carbon budget of um, uh, a thousand gigatons and we're burning 40 gigatons a year and um so in 25 years we're going to run out of the budget and um that means that we need a very different attitude to the way that we are um we're operating so it was very much a um uh, that was the original con con idea behind the carbon bubble and um the idea has now become much more widely appreciated and used but but, but it was mark who, who really came up with it and popularized it a, a decade ago um, the the change really that's taken place over the last 10 years um, is that what was a kind of moral argument has now increasingly become an economic argument because mm. fortunately the cost of these other technologies and solar and wind and batteries, electric vehicles and, 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 and various other new energy technologies, the cost has fallen so far uh, that actually it becomes... Uh, it, economically sensible to embrace these technologies because it's cheaper and better and cleaner and faster and therefore people are doing so and that in turn then creates uh, cr creates very significant problems for investors in, uh, in, 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 in the incumbent disrupted fossil fuel industry. What is it that you're currently working on then? Can you tell us? Um, we're working on a wide range of issues but really thinking through the consequences for financial markets. I've got a financial market background and I guess I was hired to think through what are the financial market consequences of um, of, of this shift because um, it, it's, people often argue that we, we're using 100 million barrels of oil a day today and we're still going to use, let's say, 80 million barrels of oil a day in, in 20 years' time. Therefore, there is no risk. Um, and, and I think in order to bankrupt that argument, you only have to look at what has happened to the oil price in the wake of a 3% fall uh, in demand, thanks to uh, thanks to coronavirus, and the oil price has halved, and, and oil stocks have been in free fall. And that's mm. just a cyclical short-term driver. Uh, can you imagine how much more significant and powerful it will be if actually for the first time in its over 100-year history, the industry actually has to face uh, a structural uh, long-term uh, decline in, in demand. And that's the kind of analysis that we're now doing is thinking through what are the consequences for investors uh, in in the fossil fuel 
extraction and usage sectors of this shift. Well, then moving on to talking about net zero by 2050, do you think politicians, one, do you think politicians have a plan? And two, do you think they're being honest about the repercussions of said plan? Well, as you know, we we uh, we do have a plan for um, uh, net zero carbon emissions in 2050. Um, and that was passed by the last Conservative government, if memory serves me right. Um, and Yeah, that was under Theresa May, yeah great news is that we can we can do this um, because the technology has now evolved to such a degree that it's now cheaper in 90 percent of countries including the uk to generate uh, electricity from solar and wind than it is from from the old way of doing it from fossil fuels um, and furthermore the price of batteries is falling so quickly that within a couple of years, it will be cheaper to buy. Uh, and in fact, it's already cheaper to buy and run an electric car. And within a couple of years, it's going to be cheaper to buy an um, electric car than a conventional car. Um, and then the same, uh, the same innovation is spreading across other areas of fossil fuel usage. So the first and the greatest point is that actually, um, we don't have to make huge sacrifices in the way that people thought we would do 10 years ago, because, because our uh, in, innovators and technological leaders come up with solutions. Um, I think the second point is, and I guess this is a point pe- people made much more than 10 years ago, but it's still valid. You know, it's not like the use of fossil fuels comes without cost. Um, so you've got two primary areas of, of, of cost or externalities. One is the, uh, the, the, the deaths directly linked to, um, to fossil fuel usage which according to CREA um, is four and a half million globally, about 30 to 40,000 people in the UK dying from um, complications of breathing and um, cancers linked directly to fossil fuel usage. So that's one area of, of direct cost of using fossil fuels. And then the other, of course, is global warming, where there's a long debate as to how expensive is it all these fires and floods and um, heat waves and everything else, and you know, the answer is it's at least fifty dollars a ton, probably considerably more. But we're now in a world stuff is just not being taxed right now, um, or it is in a very small number of areas, but it's not being taxed globally. Which then brings me on to my third point, actually, um, in terms of why this is the right thing for the UK to do, is that um, the UK can use our a pretty far-sighted um, policy to actually dominate some of the new industries of the future. Um, so there's no point trying to prop up a dying industry like coal mm. or a, a dying industry like like conventional cars. You might as well be a leader in electric vehicles or offshore wind. Yeah, uh, well... Speaking of, of offshore wind, we hear a lot about offshore wind, the falling cost of it. But isn't that just a big myth when you consider the system cost connections and backup required to stabilise a grid relying heavily on interme- intermittent energy rather is absolutely huge. And it's actually growing that cost and not included in the headline figure of these subsidies. This is a false narrative and it's incorrect. Um, OK, so to give you the numbers to give you the numbers. Uh, it's costing about um, 40 to 50 uh, dollars per megawatt hour to get your electricity from uh, wind in the UK and, and globally a little bit less from solar. Um, and then your your uh, your connection and intermittency costs might be five to ten percent of that. So five to maybe five to ten dollars per megawatt hour. It's definitely not enough to elevate the cost even above the conventional cost of of coal and gas without costing without thinking about the externalities. Can we move on to the Green New Deal now? Now a lot of people of of my uh, free market persuasion are slightly concerned that actually all the Green New Deal is far from being a a look into what markets uh, and being competitive can actually achieve is simply a 
proxy, basically, to achieve a command economy, a reversion to sort of socialist command economies that we've seen in the past. What do you think about that argument? Do you think there there can be a, a free market solution with a Green New Deal in mind? There's a great book by uh, Anatole Levin, which has um, which came out uh, this month, um, called Climate Change and the Nation State. And one of the arguments that Anatole makes in that book, he says, look, um, this is a big problem. Um, so climate change is a big problem. We have to sort it out. And what that means is both the left and the right have got to ditch some of their um, uh, some of their uh, uh, longstanding desires, should we say. So, you know, on the right, you've got to, to, to ditch the um, idea that you can have a completely free market economy without paying for pollution. On the left, you've got to ditch um, all these uh, all, all, all these uh, different issues that they're trying to shoehorn in on the back of it, like socialism and um, all of the uh, 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 different other isms that they want to 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 bring on on the back of it. And that you know, both sides are wrong to try and bring in their own um, agenda to an issue which actually needs a much more uniform. Um, a, a approach. I mean, the same way, actually, as we're a, a tackling or seeking to tackle this coronavirus as a as a, as a nation um, coming together and bringing the best people to do it, we need to be doing the same thing with uh, with global warming, climate mm. change. Uh, and one way of doing that is through a carbon tax, right? So, yeah, I mean, c- coming to this issue about carbon tax, um, I... I I guess I've been knocking around looking at this issue for quite a while, and I um, was surprised. I finally managed to find some amazing data from the OECD on on UK and global carbon taxes, and here's the number. So um, we basically have two types of carbon tax in the UK. We've got carbon tax on petrol and diesel, the stuff we, 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 we drive with, where we, we're taxing it, according to the OECD, at 260 um uh, 260 euros a ton. Um, and then we have everything else. Um, so that's like uh, gas and electricity and industry and airplanes and ships and stuff. And, and all the other stuff we're taxing in at $10 a ton. Um, so, so the point to me is on, on, sorry, 10 euros a ton. The point to me is if we go back to this issue of, of, um, the fact that somebody is paying for this stuff, um, ultimately, and the, the, the amount that they're paying for it through their health and through the consequences of global warming is, as I say, at least 100 uh, euros or dollars a ton. And, and we've got about three quarters of our, of our consumption in this country is being taxed at only 10. That makes absolutely no sense. Mm-hmm. Um, because what happens if you don't tax something is people, um, you know, people like fly to Spain for 20 pounds or they'll you know, to go from Manchester to London, they'll fly via Lanzarote, whatever it is, because it's cheaper to do so. Um, so you're getting these absolutely mad uses of, 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 a, of a, what should be a relatively scarce resource because we're not pricing it properly. People having, are having to breathe in this pollution if they're living in cities or underneath flight paths and they're having to um, handle the costs if they live by the coast or, or in somewhere rainy. So we are paying for these costs. Mm. And uh, but the people who are incurring them are not paying for them. Well, I wonder then how do you how do you ensure that a carbon tax doesn't simply ensure that the United Kingdom offsets its carbon by importing it from elsewhere? How do you how do you ensure that there are suggestions of things like border adjustment, for example, where we ensure that other countries' imports to this country are taxed on their carbon intensity. Uh, yeah, I'm, that will that's already part of the plan for Europe. And it's, not, again, another one of these ideas whose time has for certain come. That will happen. You will have carbon border taxation. And, and actually what all that will do is it'll, it will oblige other countries to start imposing their own carbon taxes because um, uh, <clears throat> if you're taking the money, then they're going to want to have the money themselves. Um, so I'm, I'm confident we will see carbon border taxes. Um, but there's... There's another. There's a couple of other really important points to be made here. Um, first of all, don't forget the numbers we're talking about are really not that big. So if you were to put on, for the sake of argument, an initial carbon tax of about thirty pounds a ton, which is what they're talking about 
in the US, um, then the average person in the UK is using 12 tons of carbon a year, so that's 360 pounds. Um, so it's, it's, it's a chunky sum to have, but given our GDP per capita is 30,000, um, it's not actually a, it, it's not a completely unreasonable amount of money. Um, and then uh, the, the other point I guess to be made here is that what's now happening in, in, in the US is this, this, uh, this is Ted Halstead and the Baker Schultz plan is pushing the idea of having um, a, a carbon dividend. So that is to say you tax people on their use of this, of, of carbon, uh, and then you pay everybody back with a kind of citizen dividend. Um, and that makes the whole thing much more just because uh, obviously rich people use more stuff and buy more stuff than poor people. And therefore, um, the, 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 the danger is that this becomes a regressive tax, but actually you can make it a, a, a much fairer tax. And how do you do that, though? Because obviously it's a larger share of income, isn't it, for a, some the least well-off in society, a larger proportion? Uh, so, it's, so, as I say, that's why you have the, you have the rebate, and you can skew yeah. the rebate if you want to. But if you come back to this £360 per, um, per person, um, if the average... So somebody in the top decile might be spending eight hundred pounds. Somebody in the lower decile, in the bottom decile, might be spending one hundred pounds. They both, uh, so they both get taxed one hundred and eight hundred, but they both get the three hundred and sixty. So actually, if you have this distributed, if you have this money redistributed to the population, it becomes something which, which means that people in the lower income deciles actually get more money from it. Do you think if we put in place this carbon tax and it reduces the UK's competitiveness, but other countries don't reciprocate with their own carbon taxes, that actually all we'll end up doing is exporting British jobs overseas and not seeing any of the benefits for it? Is that a risk? Uh, it, there is no reason to imagine that that's going to happen. And actually the countries which have implemented carbon taxes like Sweden and Denmark um, have seen that they've got allow their industries to get a head start and to uh, dominate these these uh, these new areas. So the largest energy company in Europe now is uh, uh, Orsted, uh, which used to be Danish oil and natural gas and reinvented itself as a wind company uh, about ten years ago, and it's just overtaken Equinor in terms of market capitalization. Um, and and that is precisely the point by setting up conditions for which are a much better reflection of how the future is going to be, we can act as a kind of petri dish in the UK um, to enable our businesses to, to, to be able to do it first. I mean, I don't know, you're too young, I guess, but if you go back to the old debates we used to have in the UK in the, like, the 1970s about how we got leapfrogged by the Germans because, you know, they, they did all this stuff after the war and we failed to because we stuck with the old technologies. Um, that's the kind of thing we want to avoid doing again. Let's 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 move on to the superior, better technology of the future, and not try and stick with the old ones. Well, actually, speaking of those technologies, what do you think the role of on, the entrepreneur is in this, and and the innovator? Do you think they have a, a pivotal role in shaping the future and, and the way in which we tackle climate change, or do you think that's quite redundant? Is it is it more about government intervention? Um. It's all about entrepreneurs and innovators. So now is your time, or our time, I guess. Um, and uh, governments need to set a reasonable framework, and governments, um, and again, there's all good free market stuff, but governments need to create a level playing field whereby these new technologies can actually um, uh, flourish uh, successfully. And that's, I think, the primary role of government in this uh, in, in this new world. And then uh, we need to, to let the innovators and entrepreneurs get on with it. What technologies do you think, I mean, are you reading about anything at the moment? What new technologies do you think might be developed? And what are the investment opportunities in these new green technologies? It has to be absolutely stressed that all of the growth in the future in our energy system, without question, is going to come from... Uh, new energy uh, opportunities and uh, 
So, so to give you the numbers, to be clear, global uh, fossil fuel demand has been growing at 1% a year, roughly, for about the last decade. Um, and uh, it's now going to go into minus 1%, right? So that's, that's basically game over for all that stuff. Um, but in order to substitute it, um, solar is going to increase over the course of this decade fivefold, wind tenfold, electric vehicles 50-fold, batteries 100-fold. Um, all of the technologies surrounding these, uh, these, these innovations, a whole new hydrogen economy has got to be built. Um, so there's so much growth, there's so much opportunity, that's where you need to be focusing right now. You're painting quite a positive picture and making it all sound quite easy. Are there any unforeseen challenges that you can see potentially coming around the corner? Well, I, I don't think <laughs> it's going to be easy, right? You know, building an entirely new energy economy is going to be really difficult. And expensive. Um, uh, and it's going to be expensive, uh, albeit much cheaper than not building it. Let's be absolutely clear on that issue. Um but the real impediment to change is incumbency. Taking into consideration Extinction Rebellion want us to be carbon neutral by 2025, where do you think realistically we will actually be by 2025? So we have been on record for some time as saying that global fossil fuel demand will peak before 2025. Um, this coronavirus um, cyclical episode may actually bring forward that peak um, and, and uh, uh, make it earlier. So we're pretty confident that we've already seen peak demand for conventional cars. We've probably now seen peak demand for fossil fuels in electricity generation. And if uh, the impacts of the coronavirus carry on for long enough, we will see peak demand for all fossil fuels earlier than the date we had anticipated. So I think to get to zero is, uh, is, is, is a tough ask, shall we say. But to reach a peak, and start down the other side and give therefore everybody hope for a much cleaner future yeah we, we can we can we can achieve that for sure by 2025 i wonder if to end kingsmill you wouldn't mind telling our listeners why you're either optimistic or pessimistic about the uk's energy transition and why it'll be the most important driver of financial markets and geopolitics in the modern era um so I'm extremely optimistic because we have got surprisingly good um, leadership in terms of having a target and the amazing Committee on Climate Change, um, uh, which is, a, as you know, is a non-partisan organization, trying to figure out clever solutions um, for getting to this target. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm extremely optimistic that we have the policy framework of also extremely optimistic that our entrepreneurs and innovators, so organizations like Oxford PV, for example, um, in, the, uh, in, in the solar space and uh, the people who are doing offshore wind and now hydrogen, I'm very confident that they will continue to come up with clever solutions. Why, why, do, why do I think this is so important? Energy transition, which is directly comparable with the shift from fossil fuels to renewables, is what happened 200 years ago, um, led by the UK, when the world moved from biomass to fossil fuels. And to be clear, that led to a sevenfold increase in energy use per person and a sevenfold increase in uh, global population. It made Britain world's top nation and it completely turned uh, geopolitics upside down. So that's what happened last time we had an energy transition of this magnitude. and. Um, that, I guess, is why I'm extremely enthused about what's going to happen this time round. Well, time will so tell. To, to, to be sorry, to be absolutely clear in terms of the really positive aspects of all this and the reason why people need to, to, to realise that the future is bright, the, 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 the great story about renewables is that the energy required to put up a solar panel or a wind turbine is now repaid 30 or 40 fold by the energy that you get from the, from the wind uh, or from the sun. That's far higher than you can get from coal or oil or natural gas. And, and it means that actually humanity has got the ability to have a leap, <laughs> you know, a, a leapfrog in terms of our uh, capacity to extract energy. 
that we have not had for 200 years. Thank you very much for giving that optimistic take. So my pleasure. You can subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you get your podcasts. And for more films, blogs, podcasts and reports, go to our website, iea.org.uk. Thank you for listening.